Edward Nichols, 50, Roy Wilson, 35, and Edward Dewey Morris, 25, all residents of Bend, Oregon, decided to grab opportunity by its horns, or rather, its fur, when, in the fall of 1923, three men accepted a friend's offer to use a trapper's cabin in the Deschutes National Forest. These three men were going to spend the year trapping animals for their valuable fur, a lucrative job for those experienced and daring enough to isolate themselves in the unforgiving wilderness in the name of the hunt, and in the name of the money that came with it. A few months had passed when the eldest trapper, Edward Nichols, returned to his hometown of Bend one week prior to Christmas to sell a sleigh full of valuable furs he had trapped and treated. He boasted cheerfully to locals of the success he was having fur trapping before returning back to the cabin. Four weeks later, Alan Wilcoxon was traveling by snowshoe from his home in Fall River to the resort he owned at Elk Lake. He stopped to visit with the three men in their cabin and socialized with them throughout the evening. They were in high spirits, he recalled, as their trapping endeavors had been successful. On January 16th, Allen left the men to continue to his resort, the Elk Lake Lodge. This was the last time anyone would see the three men alive ever again. Innes Morris, brother of the youngest trapper Dewey, became worried when he heard that the mink traps set throughout the forest had not been checked on or maintained. When a search party was finally convened in April, they descended upon the cabin to find it empty. Food had burned on the stove, and it was as if the pots had been sitting over a fire for a prolonged amount of time before burning up and the fire burning out. The dinner table was set for a meal that seemingly never occurred. Rifles, traps, and heavy clothing were found in the cabin. Magazines and papers were scattered about, and the skin racks and dryers were in a neglected condition. A cat was also discovered, emaciated, but still alive. The animal's condition seemed to confirm the timeline. Whatever happened had occurred months before. There were no signs that the men had prepared for a trip. More alarming than the lack of human presence was an empty fox pen that housed five valuable foxes which the men had promised to feed and take care of for Ed Logan, the owner of the cabin, in exchange for their use of the property. But the pen was empty except for a bloody, claw-tipped hammer. The family and friends of the men, now highly alarmed, ventured out of the perimeter of the cabin where it was found that all the traps the men had set out were unattended they still contained 12 trapped marten, as well as four foxes and a wayward skunk. The animals had evidently been there for some time, as they were shriveled and had frozen. At that point, word reached Clarence A. Adams, the deputy Deschutes County Sheriff and game warden, and he and his team came to the cabin to assist in the search. The next day, about a quarter mile from the cabin, on the frozen snow-covered shores of Lava Lake, Investigators found the men's large sleigh covered in dark brown stains, which were later revealed to be human blood stains. In the snow leading up to the lake itself, they saw red patches and what seemed to be a human molar and human hair partially thawed in the frost. It seemed as if a piece of ice had been cut out of the frozen lake and the bodies deposited under the layers of ice. The lake had refrozen over and snow had piled up in the depression. Looking out at the ominous frozen lake, they saw strange bulky shapes under the ice, which they were sure were their missing friends and family members. Later that evening, Innes and the sheriff went to the lake to catch some fish for supper, but when they arrived, they were surprised that the day's sun had thawed out the frozen lake partially, revealing a rowboat, which, once joined by Ed Logan, the owner of the cabin, they towed to where they thought the hole in the ice had been. There they found the men's bodies, slightly decomposed, floating in the icy waters. The rescuers sadly tied ropes to the bodies and rowed them back to the shores of the lake, where they fastened them to the snow shelf to wait out the night until the morning sun brought some more manpower and hopefully some answers. 
Adams, the lead investigator, donned his snowshoes and ran the distance back to town to get more help. Wrapped in muslin material, the former trappers were bloodied and brutally mutilated. It looked like whomever had committed these atrocities had tried to hack up the bodies after killing them to dispose of them, but had done so unsuccessfully. Besides many hammer indentations that covered their bodies, Edward Nichols had a shotgun blast to the jaw, which shattered it, and a revolver bullet wound to the head. Ominously, his watch had stopped at 9.10. Roy Wilson had been shot in the right shoulder and back of the head, and Dewey Morris had a shotgun wound to his left shoulder and a skull fracture, seemingly from the same instrument used to bludgeon the other two men, the hammer. One man stood out as a suspect, Lee Collins. Ed Logan, the property owner, recalled Collins had trapped with Nichols, one of the deceased men, the year before, and the two had quarreled over a wallet that Nichols believed Lee Collins had stolen. Logan also recalled that this Collins fellow had explicitly told Nichols that one day he would come back and kill him. Logan recalled that Collins also went by the name Charles Kimsey. This name was familiar to law enforcement, as in 1923, Kimsey had hired a car and a driver, and then in the middle of the trip, bludgeoned the driver, bound him in wire, and threw him down a well, before taking the car and continuing the trip solo. Luckily, the driver managed to survive and to tell his story. A government-employed fur trapper, Kimsey was known to be a great shot with both a revolver and a rifle. Knowing that this man was highly dangerous and possibly deranged, police issued a $1,500 reward for his capture, which is the equivalent of over $20,000 today. Later, it was revealed that several months earlier, Charles Kimsey was spotted in the nearby town of Portland, Oregon by a traffic officer when Kimsey approached him and asked where he could sell his sack of furs. The officer directed him to the Shoemaker Fur Company, where Kimsey sold several furs to owner Carl Shoemaker for $110 cash, the equivalent of about $1,500 today. After going through his records, Shoemaker told police that the seller had noted his name as Ed Nichols. It had been on January 22nd, just a week after Wilcoxon had seen the trappers alive. Whoever sold these furs had used Nichols' trapper's license and was the man responsible for the triple killing. Police and the public searched diligently for Kimsey for four years until the case went cold and was thought of only by friends, family, and those close to the investigation. That was until nine years after the crime, when, in February of 1933, a jail warden was walking down the street when he walked right past Kimsey, whom he recognized immediately. Officers were dispatched and Kimsey was arrested without incident. He denied the crime and produced an alibi, claiming he had spent the winter of 1923-24 in Colorado working on the Moffat Tunnel. He even ate his Christmas dinner there, he said, right inside the tunnel. When Kimsey's employment with Moffat was confirmed, Macaulay and his staff scrambled to round up other evidence, still utterly convinced they had their suspect. However, the case fell apart when Shoemaker refused to definitely identify Kimsey, as, after a lapse of nine years, Kimsey had aged considerably since he last saw him and had grown quite bald. Shoemaker stated that a man's life was too great a thing to place in jeopardy if he wasn't absolutely certain. The traffic policeman also refused to definitely identify Kimsey. But, while he was never tried for the Lava Lake murders, despite all evidence pointing to him, Kimsey ended up being charged with the attempted murder of the car driver, who was able to positively identify him, and Kimsey was sentenced to life in prison. <laughs>